I get this question a lot. Did you grow up going to a lot of Disney parks or Universal? Are you from Orlando or Anaheim? Maybe you grew up in Ohio and went to Cedar Point or Kings Island. The answer to all of those questions is no, none of the above. I grew up in Kansas City. There are no big resorts or beachside amusement parks. To be honest, nothing is in Kansas. There's a good amount of wheat, prairie, livestock, a surprising lack of buffalo despite the song. In fact, I've never even seen one, and if I did, it would technically be a bison. There's cornfields and windmills and weather vanes and an occasional tornado. You've seen the first 20 minutes of The Wizard of Oz. It's basically that. While my few vacations to Disneyland and Walt Disney World were what initially sparked my interest in theme parks, there was something closer to home that kept me interested in the medium between my trips to Disney. It was a small regional park called Worlds of Fun. And while in this season of Defunct Land, we have gone to Florida, California, Ohio, Illinois, the UK, Paris, Japan, and much more, I wanted to take our travels to today's destination for personal reasons. Because there is no place like home. Even if all we have there is Worlds of Fun. And even if we don't technically have that, since Worlds of Fun is on the Missouri side of Kansas City, not the Kansas side, nothing is in Kansas. Born on August 2, 1932, Lamar Hunt was raised in Dallas, Texas, a member of a family of oil tycoons. With his father and two of his brothers possessing obscene wealth, Hunt was set for life. After graduating from college, he attempted to purchase a franchise in the National Football League, but his bids were unsuccessful. Frustrated, he concocted a plan that was a bit more convoluted. He would start his own professional football league. This idea would develop into the American Football League, which would hold its first season in 1960. This allowed Hunt to get exactly what he wanted, a team under his ownership, the Dallas Texans. His team would become one of the most successful teams in the league. However, the same year that the AFL held its first games, the NFL would expand with the addition of more teams, including the new Dallas Cowboys. It was immediately clear that both the Cowboys and the Texans could not be profitable so close to one another, and Hunt made the decision to relocate his team to another city. He eventually decided on Kansas City, renaming the Dallas Texans to the Kansas City Chiefs. Hunt would continue to be involved in the city over the next decade, helping fuel its population and economic growth in the late 60s. Around this time is when Hunt and his business partner, Jack Stedman, first conceived plans for a new entertainment project in the Midwestern city. It was a brand new theme park, to be named Worlds of Fun. Construction on Worlds of Fun began in 1971 and cost an estimated $20.5 million to build. Located just north of downtown Kansas City, the new park was not far from the city's already existing amusement park, Fairyland Park, which had opened in 1923. The park boasted a few impressive rides and coasters, but Hunt and Stedman seemed confident that their new park would easily best the aging Fairyland. Worlds of Fun was designed by famous park designer and Kansas native Randall Dwell, the man behind many amusement parks, including Kings Island and Astroworld. Worlds of Fun was themed after Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days, and the park was to be split into five main areas, Africa, Americana, Europa, Scandinavia, and the Orient. Worlds of Fun was to have a variety of carnival rides and a few coasters. One of these thrill rides, Shus Boomer, was a wild mouse coaster located in the Scandinavia section of the park. This was one of famed coaster designer Anton Schwarzkopf's Wildcat models, which Worlds of Fun bought used. There was also the Zambi Z Zinger, located in the Africa section of the park. This coaster, another Schwarzkopf creation, was an extended jumbo jet model with an electric spiral lift hill. These two rides, along with a small children's coaster in the Europa section of the park, were the only coasters that were in the initial plans for Worlds of Fun. But they, along with the park's other attractions and a concerted effort toward theming, were expected to draw crowds. Hunt was so confident with the park's future success that he drafted plans for a larger entertainment complex, with hotels, restaurants, and other entertainment options surrounding the park. After four years of planning and two years of construction, Worlds of Fun was ready to open its gates to its first season of guests. Worlds of Fun opened on May 26, 1973, and the park was an immediate success, with large crowds attending its opening and ensuing inaugural season. The park blew its competition out of the water. Less than five years after Worlds of Fun's opening, Fairyland Park would close down. 
While management would cite storm damage as the reason for the park's closure, it was clear that the opening of Worlds of Fun had a heavy financial toll for the over 50-year-old park. Towards the end of its run, Fairyland would use the not-so-subtle slogan, where fun is still affordable. Fairyland's closure was great news for Worlds of Fun, and Hunts Park would continue to expand and add new attractions. Unfortunately, the 1973 oil crisis put a halt on Hunt's plans for an entertainment resort, most likely due to both the ensuing economic slump and his wealth's close relation to the oil industry. In 1976, three years after Worlds of Fun's opening, a new coaster would be constructed in the Americana section of the park. To coincide with America's bicentennial, an aero development corkscrew coaster named Screamroller debuted. Aero Development, the California-based amusement park ride designer and manufacturer, had been dropped by the Walt Disney Company five years prior, immediately after assisting with the construction of Walt Disney World's Magic Kingdom. Its founder sold the company the next year, with a few staying on in consulting roles. As the company shifted its focus away from Disneyland and Walt Disney World and began focusing solely on regional amusement parks, the steel coasters that Aero produced were a hit among park guests, and Worlds of Fun Scream Roller was no exception. However, the coaster was nothing special, as Aero had manufactured the ride type many times, placing similar, if not identical, coasters in various amusement parks throughout the world. After the success of Scream Roller, Worlds of Fun reached back out to Aero in hopes that they would build another coaster. But this time, the ride that Aero would deliver would be one of a kind. I thought I'd seen it all, but this, this was the big one. It didn't seem like any part of Kansas City I knew. It seemed strange. Thousands had been lured here before me in breathless wonder. You can't explain that feeling that draws you to the unknown. Unknown, but getting closer with each nervous step. Orient Express opened on April 4th, 1980, to the delight of both park guests and coaster enthusiasts. The coaster was located in the Orient section of the park, which at the time only had a few flat rides, which were actually just vehicles for bad puns, hence the bamboo zlur. There was also a dolphin show in this area, which really proves how mistreated those animals were. Having a dolphin show in Kansas City is like having a bird show underground. When entering the Orient section, guests would walk through a Tory gate. They would then make their way toward the back of the area, finding the large Orient Express and passing under its entrance. The giant red coaster was intimidating, and the queue featured a rare chicken exit, where guests could duck out of line if they became too nervous to ride. After boarding the train, guests would exit the loading station, go through a short tunnel, and climb the first hill. A short bank to the right would lead into the ride's biggest drop, plunging guests 115 feet toward the ground. Another hill and bank to the left would send guests into the ride's first inversion. After this, guests would turn right back around and enter the ride's second interlocking loop. The train would then enter an element never before seen in a roller coaster. The Orient Express was the first attraction to feature a batwing element, then dubbed the Kamikaze Curve and sometimes referred to as a boomerang. On the Orient Express, the train turned sharply to the left, briefly suspending guests upside down before leveling out, dropping, and entering the reverse of the previous element, sending the train back in the opposite direction than the one it entered. After the Kamikaze Curve, the train would bank sharply to the left, then speed over a small pond, doing a 360-degree bank turn before returning to the station. The entire experience was around two and a half minutes, and the ride would reach speeds of over 50 miles per hour. The Orient Express cost $4 million to build, and it was expected to bring an additional 130,000 guests to Worlds of Fun in the first year of its operation alone. The park took a huge risk with the investment. Its debut was at a time when the number of coaster enthusiasts was growing exponentially, and smaller theme parks were pressured into installing larger attractions. The goal for a regional park was to have a signature attraction that held at least one or more world records. This would draw the attention of both the casual guest and the dedicated coaster fan. Orient Express was not the tallest or the fastest, but at the time of its opening, it was one of only two coasters in the world to have interlocking loops, the other being the Loch Ness Monster at Busch Gardens in Tampa. This, along with it being the first coaster to implement a boomerang element, was enough to draw public interest, and news of the coaster's debut spread, not just across the United States, but across the world. Luckily for Worlds of Fun, the coaster was made with high capacity in mind, and it was much needed when the ride opened. The Orient Express could cycle in and out around 1,800 guests per hour. The ride would continue to draw crowds over its first few years of operation, and it would fuel Worlds of Fun's growth throughout the 80s. In 1982, a new water park titled Oceans of Fun opened directly next to the park, 
At 60 acres, it was the largest water park in the world at the time of its opening. A year later, in 1983, Scream Roller would be renovated into Extreme Roller, with new stand-up ride vehicles designed by Aero. This made Extreme Roller America's first stand-up coaster, another win for Worlds of Fun. Uh, where do I sit? You don't. Unfortunately, the new ride type took a toll on the pre-existing track, and Extreme Roller would convert back to a sit-down coaster after just a year. The opening day coaster Shush Boomer was removed around this time as well. The Orient Express, now seven years old, was still the park's signature attraction, and it had operated efficiently and without incident since its opening. However, this streak would not last long. On June 15, 1987, a train entering Orient Express's station slammed into another train that was still boarding passengers. Nine guests were injured in the incident, eight with neck injuries and bruises, and one with back discomfort. Firefighters quickly arrived to the scene, using ladders to bring guests from the elevated track down to the ground, while other guests climbed from car to car to reach the station. The exact cause of the accident was not revealed, but it is suspected that the high-capacity procedures were to blame. Employees were known to override brakes and manually push trains in and out of the station on busy days. A year later in 1988, Extreme Roller was removed. While its closure was disappointing to many fans, Worlds of Fun would debut a new coaster in 1989 that would make them forget all about it. The Timberwolf was a wooden beast. It was the park's longest coaster, and coaster enthusiasts celebrated its debut. It would also be the last coaster to open under Hunt's management. In the summer of 1995, Hunt and his company would sell Worlds of Fun and Oceans of Fun to the popular regional theme park chain, Cedar Fair. Hunt's company claimed that the deal was to transfer their focus away from the theme park industry and to ensure Worlds of Fun's prosperity. Cedar Fair wasted no time in making the park their own, and the new owners would remove the Zambezi Zinger in 1997 and construct the 205-foot-tall Mamba to debut in 1998. The new coaster once again distracted fans from the removal of a classic, and the ambitious steel coaster would quickly become a favorite of park guests. Worlds of Fun now had three major coasters to draw fans in, the Timberwolf, the Mamba, and the Orient Express. Unfortunately, the reign of the Big Three would be much shorter than Cedar Fair would have hoped. On July 17, 1999, the two rear cars of a train on the Orient Express derailed as it slowed into the station. The passengers in those cars were left dangling 35 feet in the air. The rescue took two hours, as guests were carefully removed from their seats and lowered to the ground. Rumors quickly spread that two people jumped from the dangling cars in fear, but this was never confirmed by authorities or park officials. In total, 13 guests were taken to the hospital but all were released without serious injuries. Inspections after the accident showed internal fatigue on a metal support. The unusual fracture was unlikely to be spotted during inspections, as it wasn't noticeable from the outside. Even if it had been seen, there was no guarantee that a thorough inspection would have taken place. At the time, Missouri was one of 12 U.S. states that had no inspection regulations for permanent amusement park attractions. Despite the incident, the Orient Express would continue to operate into the 2000s, but the over 20-year-old coaster was showing its age. As with many aero steel coasters, the ride experience became more rough in its later years, and the recent incident had clouded the reputation of the once groundbreaking coaster. Despite all of these warning signs, fans were shocked to hear that the coaster would not reopen for the 2004 season, operating for the last time on October 26, 2003. There was no announcement prior to its closure, and the coaster was already being dismantled at the end of the 2003 season. The park's official announcement, coming a few days after the ride's closure, stated that extremely high maintenance costs and plans for new attractions in the area are what sparked the decision. During the announcement, Cedar Fair announced the addition of a new coaster, Spinning Dragons, to be placed on part of the Orient Express's former site. The new attraction would be a spinning coaster, the second of its kind. It would have rotating cars, with four inward-facing guests spinning on an independent axis throughout the ride. The coaster was not nearly as ambitious as the Orient Express, and it reached the short max height of 54 feet and only lasted around a minute and a half. The new coaster would debut on April 17, 2004, and unlike the opening of the Timberwolf and the Mamba, the addition did not distract fans from the Orient Express's closure. Luckily, Cedar Fair had another ride up their sleeve, and just two years later in 2006, the inverted B&M coaster Patriot would debut, utilizing more of the land freed by the removal of the Orient Express. The new coaster excited fans and drew in larger crowds. While dedicated fans were still upset at the Orient Express's removal, the investment in the $14 million coaster was widely celebrated. Three years later in 2009, a new wooden coaster, the Prowler, would debut, receiving praise from enthusiasts and positive reactions from park guests. Sadly, this was the last new coaster that Worlds of Fun has introduced. Now in 2018, nearly a decade after the opening of the Prowler, Worlds of Fun has stagnated, retaining only six major coasters. Prowler, Timberwolf, Mamba, Spinning Dragons, 
Patriot, and Boomerang, a Vekoma Boomerang coaster that had been added in 2000. Worlds of Fun is not Cedar Fair's first priority, nor should it be, but having been nine years without a new coaster, local park goers can't help but feel ignored. It is a far cry from the years following the debut of the Orient Express, and with a lack of variety and no foreseeable additions, fans are becoming more and more nostalgic for the fallen coaster. Worlds of Fun has not forgotten about the former ride either, and on top of continuing to sell merchandise related to the ride, there are a few remnants worth mentioning. One is the use of the Orient Express's chicken exit sign in the queue for the Timberwolf, and another is the utilization of the Orient Express's former queue and ride tunnel, which Worlds of Fun now uses as a Halloween haunted house. As we continue our travels on this exciting season of Defunct Land, it's important for all of us to recognize how special our common interest in theme parks and themed entertainment is, especially considering how different our places of origin. For many, you grew up near Walt Disney World and Universal Studios, or maybe Disneyland. Some of you grew up near Busch Gardens Williamsburg, or Kings Island, or Alton Towers. For the unlucky few among us, your home park was Nara Dreamland, or Astro World. And for those like me, it was worlds of fun. No matter your home park, even the underwhelming ones, there is some unique art to be found there, or at the very least, some interesting stories. And while there might be nothing in Kansas, it is true that there is no place like home. Now, how do I program these things to Epcot? 